So good day. Um, my name is Dr. Crystal Tribbett, and um, I have the pleasure of speaking with Gerald Parham for In Our Own Words, the UCI Black Alumni um, Chapter Oral History Project. Today is Thursday, October 13th. No, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday, October 13th. I should get that right. Um, so thank you so much for speaking with me today, Gerald. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm going to start off with some uh, easy uh, well, thank questions. You. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Easy questions. That's that's good. All right. Um, so I'm just going to see that last line again and say thank you very much, Gerald, for joining me today. Um, and I'm going to start off with some easy questions about your background. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about, um, you know, where you grew up, Gerald, where are you from and what was life like for you as a youngster? Um, great question. Um, let me be clear, I'm still a youngster. <laughs> um, born in New York, youngest of four kids to uh, Sadie and William Parham. Uh, parents separated, mom moved from New York to LA. So I grew up um, most of my formative years in Los Angeles, kind of all over LA, from the projects in East LA to parts of South Central to Miracle Mile District to um, the outskirts of Beverly Hills by the time it was all done. Uh, growing up was, um, well, you know, when you're poor, but you don't know you're poor. So for a single mom with uh, really a high school education and maybe two years, a year and a half of business college, um, who spent her life working for the government 33 years and raising four kids who are all literally stair steps. My parents had four kids in three years. So um, if you can imagine a single parent doing that on her own. Um, it's quite a chore. But um, because of that, I think we learned very early on uh, how to be responsible and how to care for family. Everybody had to do something to contribute to the functioning of the household or to the, you know, we couldn't go out and play. We didn't have a lot of toys. We had house chores. So from doing laundry, when I was in the fourth grade, I had to wash my, my uniform because she had pulled me out. I was the guinea pig, gotten pulled out of um, public school into Catholic school. So learning to take care of myself and having to do laundry and cook, et cetera, et cetera, was, were things that we all did. And we didn't think it, it, it wasn't uncommon because we didn't know that we didn't have to do that or that there were people in families that did that for you or whatever. So it was just part of how we grew up and what we needed to do. So. What was your family philosophy, if you had one, about, um, about education? Um, it was paramount. I mean, clearly my mother um, not going to college was not an option for us. And so um, we compromised growing up because I was, um, all of us really, my brothers uh, mostly, um, one of four, there's three boys and one girl. So um, we, we were very much interested in sports and athletics. And we finally had to convince my mom because I was, um, a reasonably good athlete then. And so I had even elementary school coaches and wanting me to play football, basketball, whatever. And my mother was like, you've, you've, you're, in, you're in here for school. So my grades got better when I was playing sports because I guess I had more responsibility and had to be held accountable for that. So when we figured that out, then I was able to play and kept my grades up. So education was clearly um, something that was stressed and, and valued. And again, we didn't have an option to not go somewhere. And you've, you've mentioned your siblings. Can you tell me your, their names? Uh, my oldest sibling is uh, Pamela. Um, next is Dr. William Parham, who is uh, faculty at LMU and chairs the MBA's mental health and wellness program. The brother that's 11 months older than I am is Dr. Thomas Parham, who um, served as vice chancellor of student affairs here at Irvine for a number of years and is currently president of Cal State University Dominguez Hills. 
So education was clearly um, really important um, for you all. And um, in high school, did you know what you wanted to study and where you wanted to go to college? Um, sort of. I mean, my, you know, people have high school yearbooks and you write like what you remember from high school. And I think mine was a little prophetic for a 17 year old. Just, I didn't have memories of high school. I had my memory written in my yearbook was becoming more aware of life and myself. And I'm thinking, who says that at 17 years old? But I had a, um, my track coach was also one of my math teachers, um, geometry teachers in high school, Chuck Franklin, who was also a clinical psychologist. And he was just a, a, a cool guy. And so I kind of wanted to be like that. So yes, I, even in my high school yearbook, again, I was going to be a psychologist um, and I was bound for the University of Hawaii, but clearly that changed out because during my high school years, my oldest brother um, had come to Irvine. And so my senior year in high school, I was able to come down and hang out with he and some other friends that had graduated from the same high school and had come down to Irvine. So I, I kind of had a, um, a good feeling about Irvine before I got here. What was your first impression? I mean, what was your what were your visits like when you were visiting your brother? Tell me a little bit more about that experience. Well, it was the or it was Orange County, which is very different than LA. And you know, we used to refer to it or my friends in LA. So you going to, you're going down behind the orange curtain just because of the climate of late 60s, 70s uh, in this country, but let alone Orange County, Southern California is very different. Um, but I liked Irvine. It's 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 world of difference now. I mean, nothing that we see and know about the campus now in terms of the surrounding area from the marketplace across the street to the apartments and the homes around this place, none of that was here. So from Mesa Court, across the street, what is now the marketplace was a grazing field for Brahma bulls and cows. In fact, when I was a, a freshman, we used to have a tea, we had a t-shirt that said Irvine ain't no cow country. So uh, it was a very different environment structurally and um, very little was here, but it was a small enough campus and knowing people, it's always nice to have, you know, people you know. So you kind of have a little bit more security, a little bit more confidence, um, just because you're not completely unfamiliar with the people or the environment. So it was, it was a good precursor for my coming down. Did you um, happen to, you know, stay overnight on campus before you enrolled and get that experience? I did. Again, I, when I came down for the weekends, I was hanging out in dorm rooms because I knew people. Um, so it was fresh. It was good. And it was small. I mean, I think um, one of the benefits, even when I got here, was um, because it was such a small community, uh, particularly for Black or African-American folks, that Mesa Court was the only residential community here. They opened Middle Earth in 1974. So I had sort of a natural mentorship. So when I moved in my freshman year into Sierra, I was still living in a Mesa Court community that had um, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and grad students who were like me. And so I had sort of a natural kinship, a natural mentorship, which is very different than as the university has grown you know, exponentially clearly, Mesa Court is all freshmen. And so there is no structure like that where they have a mentoring kind of a group that's kind of natural to the environment. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's a lot more challenging for freshmen these days to find those outlets and those networks or to have those relationships with students that are older um, and like them because they're just, you know, by the time you're sophomores and juniors, you wanna move off campus. So it become harder to find and resources. So it was, I think it was an excellent opportunity for me. I'm grateful for that. So um, what would you say was really um, tipped the scales in terms of you deciding that you were coming to UCI and you weren't going to Hawaii because Hawaii is kind of nice. <laughs> Hawaii is kind of nice. Um, it's expensive. Uh, paying out of state tuition is one thing, and you don't think about that when you apply. You just like Hawaii sounds like a great place, and you know, kind of get away. Um, but I think proximity was just far enough away from home, right? Because LA to Irvine was like a 30, 45 minute ride 
And again, having um, the additional friendships and relationships I have with people that were in my brother's classes or even people that I knew from, um, I went to Catholic high school, so it was all boys, but there were Catholic girls schools. And some of those friends that I knew had also come down to Irma. So again, it was, we were able to come in on a six week, six weeks prior to uh, school starting, we came in on a um, incoming program for minority students, which we were referred to at the time and able to experience the campus and take classes and just kind of get a head start on what that environment was going to be like. Do you remember what that program was called? I don't, um, but the head person of that was Chester Fontenot, F-O-N-T-E-N-O-T. -E um, just an impactful African-American teacher that was, uh, I think he just did, he cared about what he did in trying to help us understand how to adjust to Irvine, believing we were going to do that because we got into the institution. But understanding the transition was a little bit, going to probably be a little bit challenged because it's an environment we have never, ever really been in. So. Did he offer advice to you? And if so, kind of what was it, if you recall? Um, I'm sure he did, but, but um, off the top of my head, I'd have to really kind of go back and, and search for that. But I mean, he was very reassuring in saying that we can get through this. Um, we are not alone. It's not, not an island. He clearly encouraged us to stay connected to one another, connected to him um, as a resource, because you know, trying to get through this and, and be a hero doing it on your own was not a good strategy. So if I had to take anything away from that, I would have certainly remembered that. Who else do you remember from your years at UCI? Um, Jim Craig. Well, again, again, early influence. My brother, my oldest brother, Dr. William Parham, was, was an RA when I was a freshman. He stayed when he graduated and did his master's. And so I was an RA because I saw the advantage of doing that. And again, my background, desiring to be in mental health. Um, being an RA was a good way to work with students and have that kind of impact or influence. So Jim Craig was the housing director at the time. And so he, with anybody who worked with him, I mean, he was just a blessing. He was just a, a cool guy, had great people skills, understood what he wanted to do as a director of housing in terms of building community. There was a Sierra project that he ran for years, even after he retired, he participated and stayed with it. Um, through my older brother, again, class-wise, um, we were both in social psychology. I didn't know my brothers were, were all like in mental health and both them as psychologists. That was very coincidental <clears throat> as a family because Thomas um, was at Long Beach before he transferred down um, and was wanted to be in law enforcement. So it wasn't until we, we met, and I met Joe White, Dr. Joe White, um, changed a lot of lives, including mine. Um, just a, a monumental figure, even though he was very small in stature. Um, just very down to earth, very clear about directing and shaping lives from just seeing what your skill sets were. Um, John Whiteley, Dr. John Whiteley from social ecology was huge uh, for me. And I think for my oldest brother, um, Learned a lot from him again, social ecology and what he taught as a professor. I did a lot of my individual practicums. I came in as a psych major, didn't like how the first class went. It was huge. Said your tests and grades are not going to come from classwork, but from the readings. So like half the class dissipated after the first meeting because to them and to most of us, it was no point going to class if it wasn't going to count for anything. So I was a little dissuaded by that. So I changed to social ecology, which was really sort of the same program um, than the psychology, but it required you to have more field studies. So I had to go out and things that I would read, I could then go out and put theory to practice. And that was a lot more beneficial for me. Um, Dr. Whiteley was instrumental in me doing independent studies with him where I could work at a behavior center in uh, Fountain Valley or in Verano's Child Care Center, working with kids and and doing those kinds of, and then having to write papers and present things. Um, 
and his relationship was 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 really good. So you mentioned you had some opportunity to, through your major, go out and, and work um, um, either on campus or, or in the Orange County community. Um, yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about those experiences? Um, yeah, uh, the Behavior Center in Fountain Valley, and again, I, the name escapes me, but it allowed me to take um, things that I had read in a, in a book uh, about behavior characteristics and treatments and interventions for kids with um, ADHD or whatever um, to how to manage those. So it's not being able to see it in action and or work with it conceptually saying, hey, okay, this is how this makes sense. And I see the things that they're talking about and describing in the research. And here's how we can apply that. So that was very beneficial. I liked, I loved actually that social psychology required you to have more field practicums instead of just coursework and classes. Um, so human development was the sub, was the minor in social psychology as a degree. So that was uh, a wonderful way to go for me. Um, the campus experience was a little different. Um, worked with Ronald's childcare. They had an after school program. Um, that they ran. And so I served sort of as a counselor and um, just another adult for supervision and work with the kids who either doing homework or engage in play. Um, just kind of just being an adult supervisor. Uh, so that was a little bit different, but got to know families, um, got to see a different side of Orange County um, from a community, from a university perspective. These were families and kids of students. And I think at the time it was very different than families outside of the university in Orange County proper. What was your um, your overall perspective about um, Orange County and working and, and living there? Um, <clears throat> well, they, the reason they called Orange County behind the Orange Curtain is because it was not necessarily designed for people of color. Um, at that time, or, or really even now, but um, while it has changed drastically back then, it was not the most favored place. Um, there were a number of incidents um, that I experienced where, I mean, I, I took a field trip, had parent permissions, and the apartment I lived in off campus had another counselor, and I took some of the kids from the program that were older over to go swimming because there was no pool around here. Uh, well, one of my neighbors decided, well, we're out at the pool and I'm sitting in a chair, the kids are playing pool or playing in the pool. We get out and get ready to go back because the time is gone. And while they're in my house changing, I get a knock at the door from the sheriff's department. And apparently somebody had called the sheriffs and told them there was a black man with these three little white kids. As if I had, he starts to then tell me about kidnapping and the charges and penalties for kidnapping in, um, in Orange County. And so I'm like, well, what are you talking about in the first place? Um, another instance where there was a student uh, that lived in the same community that I was in that was murdered. And the police only came to my house. Um, as, I mean, I knew, I knew the victim, but it wasn't, why only come to my house? I was, we weren't neighbors, we just lived in the same community. But I found out that I was the only house that they came to investigate because someone reported, here's another, you know, black male or African-American male that lives in the community. So there were instances along that line. Um, we used to, um, walk from Mace Court, again, before the student center was built, we spent a lot of time going through Aldridge Park. And it was, it was just kind of eerie because at night you'd hear a lot of gunshots from what is now the preserve going from up campus drive through to Jamboree. Um, so people used to duck hunt. And so we would hear gunshots and just having that paranoia, um, sort of duck behind trees and try to migrate our way back to, to the dorms. Um, it was the time that Roots came out, and so um, I think there was a certain lack of just knowledge, I don't want to call it ignorance, but, you know, bordering things that were just different. So we would have our hair when I had hair. Um, we used to have a fro, 
right? And we would braid it up, right? And sisters would braid it up. And it would, and so folks would say, wow, I love your hair. And then like three or four hours later, when you got to comb it out to get ready to go party or to go out, it's, it looks very different to them. And they just didn't know. What did you do to your hair? Wait a minute, I just saw you a couple hours ago. So that was very different. And then roots came out. And then folks were just really scared of anybody black. Because clearly the impact of slavery and what that movie brought to the table, um, which is intimidating to people who just didn't know. So there was... Nothing happened, but just the climate you could tell was impacted by that movie back in the day. Wow. I mean, what, those are some experiences that are really difficult to, to, to um, live through, I imagine. Um, how, what kind of support did you have within the, UCI, like Black community, tell me about, um, um, you know, how you all got along <laughs> on campus um, at that time. We, we got along really well. Like I said, living in Mesa Court, Verano Place was the only other residential community really until they opened Middle Earth. So Mesa Court was it. And so to move into a community that was sort of a natural family, if you wanted to refer to, I call it a family, because again, I had sophomores, juniors, seniors, grad students who were all living in the same community and all really kind of going through the same things. We took intention to care for one another. So there are friends from back in the day that I'm still in touch with now um, because those relationships were impactful and important enough to um, to do things and keep it that way. Part of that was the activity too. I mean, I, I ran track. So the Shirley family, James Shirley, who's clearly an active alumni member now, brother Ron, um, Isom Taylor, I mean, just Jackie Jackson, I mean, um, Aldridge Patterson, Larry Jackson. Uh, it was just a, a, good, uh, a good space. And, and again, we used to have, <laughs> One of the things I'll remember is uh, because there was not a lot out here in Orange County and, and probably still isn't, at least not close to the campus. So weekends, we would turn the commons, what the old commons was, Mesa Commons, into what we called the ghetto. So Jackie Jackson was one of the older students, a couple of years older than I, and was a disc jockey. So he would, we would turn it into sort of a nightclub. And so people would come and dance and we'd party and that kind of stuff. It got to the point where even the community from Santa Ana started to come because it was better than the nightclubs that were out in the community. Um, and part of that, I think, was you know guys wanted to see what college girls look like. Um, but that was a, a nice part. Um, running track was a, a good part for me, meeting the relationships, uh, the guys that I ran with, David Williams, Hank Paul, um, again, Shirley. Um, that was a, a huge part of what I was able to uh, enjoy and, and continue to remember, I think, the impact in my growth and development over time. Were there other social activities other than the, um, other than the ghetto that you remember? Uh, yeah, we, uh, probably the most memorable one other than the weekend uh, sort of nightclub things that we called the ghetto was Black History Month. Um, was huge for us and there was a, an african-american cook named jimmy in the commons uh, we remember him distinctly because he was bow-legged um, short but he could cook and so we one year decided to have a black history celebration and so we had a soul food picnic we invited uh, the bsus from long beach san diego and usc to come down and just kind of hang out had a little intramural basketball tournament or tennis and we did all the cooking. Jimmy let us in the comments, showed us how to do whatever we were going to do. So we made all the food, fried chicken, potato salad, greens, which were hard to find out in Orange County back in the day. Uh, but we managed to get all that. So we had the picnic in Aldridge Park and we culminated it with a concert in Crawford Hall with Cool in the Gang. So, um, that was 
I mean, if you can imagine a group like that back in the 70s when they're kind of at their prime, filling up Crawford Hall because it was the only space that you could do anything indoors uh, of that size. So it was a phenomenal success the entire weekend. Um, and that was probably the most memorable event. Um, what year was that? Do you remember? Uh, I think 74. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 72, 73. So I know I, I was an RA, so I had to, let's see, 73, 74. So 74, 75, because 75, 76, I was, um, I ran with another group of RAs and was elected uh, student body vice president for administrative services. So I think I was, I think I was the first African-American to hold an executive office in ASUCI. What was that experience like? Um, what did what was that experience like? Um, what did you do? What was your your job? As I was sort of the I was sort of the liaison person to administration. So I think part of that legacy ended up being getting permission to build a student center. And while it took years after that to do that, so I think they recognized it was really trying to take what students were saying they wanted, and how do we then package that to present it to administration in a way that says this is something we need it's beneficial the campus growing and here's some needs that are identified by students how do we make that happen it was the first time i think a group of ras had run as a team in a ticket and all of us won all of our positions and um, that's that's really fantastic um to be able to be a part of that and really uh, spark something so big as the, the student center, which is really central to the campus. Yeah, um, now to this day. Yeah, I mean, we, <clears throat> from walking, I, I spent, <laughs> I spent a number of quarters in the, in the student health center from injuries because I was just playing sports and running and whatever. So if you can imagine walking from the dorms in Mesa Court over to computer science and engineering building on crutches, and just going through Aldridge Park because the building that is now the student center was not there. So it was an interesting, the, the campus now just by growth and development is, is clearly a testament to a master plan or whatever they wanted to do. But back in the day, there literally was nothing out here. So you were walking and even when we ran track, we, we ran to places that's now like Mariner's Church used to be a landfill. But that was the hill, Newport Coast, was where we used to run up as part of practice. Uh, the farm school, which is now just a couple of buildings right next to the ark, um, used to literally be a school. And they had live animals and horses. And so, yeah, it was just a very, very different environment. Um, how do you feel that your affiliations and in and involvement, even your major, has um, shaped your relationship with the university and your career trajectory? Um, it's been different. I think when I came back, I went to, I left California to go to grad school at the, to do my graduate work at the University of Florida in Gainesville, which is by comparison, it was like coming back to Irvine all over again, because the University of Florida, while is it a huge university, Gainesville, Florida is a small college town, um, very much very rural, very country, I mean, maybe 40,000 students at the time in Gainesville, but people in the surrounding suburbs would come to Gainesville because that was their version of coming to the city, where for me going to an environment with that small of a population, I'm thinking my neighborhood is bigger than this. So that was very different. Um, coming back in 98, I've now been at the University of Louisville for 23 years um, in student affairs. And again, we talk about networking and people. When I came back, I started as the director of Palo Verde Housing in student affairs. And the person who brought me back was Jim Craig, who I had served as an RA for when I was an undergraduate. So again, having that network, knowing what was going on. I came back in 98 as the director of Palo Verde Housing. Um, and then met phenomenal colleagues from um, Lisa Cornish, Beverly Cheney, um, 
colleagues that I work with who are also directors. Lisa was the executive director of housing, uh, under, of graduate housing. Beverly Cheney was the director of Ronald Place Housing. So as a team, I got to work with, with them and, and uh, learn their expertise and manage a community that grew from 204 apartments to 652 apartments by 2005. So adding, taking, um, if somebody had said I would be in property management, um, going to school to get a PhD or to do graduate work in mental health and psychology. But it gave me an opportunity to come back and say, okay, there's no res life program here. This is a chance to work with residents. So I get to take in while in Florida, let me back up a minute. While in Florida, part of what I needed to do was work to pay to go to school because I didn't have scholarships. So part of the jobs I ended up having prior to my coming back was working for a real estate developer where I was doing property management both commercial and residential. So when this particular opportunity became available um, to come back and work in housing, it was like, well, I'm, if somebody had told me I could pair the two. So now here's what I did to pay for school was to learn real estate property management. Now I get to come back and manage an apartment community, but also use my mental health background and training to build the rest life component and working with residents. So we had residents that were you know, from Korea living with residents from Tennessee who were grad students. So the cultural differences, the relationship kinds of dynamics that go on um, for those kinds of um, instances or situations, I was able to now manage and navigate again using my mental health background as well as my property management style. So it was a, a godsend to me, it was a blessing to come back and be able to start and utilize both careers in a way that I was able to do. And you're still here, yes. So <laughs> tell tell us about yeah. um, uh, your your current work at UCI, and um, um, you know what keeps you here. Um, what um, kind of fulfills you um, here at UCI? Um, currently, I work as a director of program development for the Intercollegiate Athletics Department. In that capacity. Um, Principally, I oversee all of our summer sports camps for kids. When I transitioned over to that uh, position from housing, it was with the intent, their intent was to um, increase participation with kids in the community uh, and revenue because it's a way that coaches get to supplement their income. Coaches are on contracts, so they're not like the career status that you or I may have. So I said, okay, I, I can do this. So I did my little research and went around to programs in the community and other universities and college, Long Beach, Fullerton, Concordia, even UCLA, San Diego, because they all have summer camps, uh, local community agencies, YMCAs, Boys and Girls Clubs. What were they doing if they held summer activities or summer camps for kids? And what were they doing, if anything, what were we doing different that would attract or make someone want to come to UCI, and um, we weren't really doing anything different. Um, so how do you market that? Well, part of the administration was saying, well, you got to put it out there that we're NCAA Division I coaches and athletes, man, but so is Long Beach, so is Fulton. So really what's different? What's going to make them come here? You know, we don't take the kids to the beach. We don't go on field trips. So what were we doing? So with my background in housing and knowing how students are coming to campus, talked with some police and administrators and discovered that um, freshmen and transfer students were not making the adjustments very well. So there was a statistically significant increase in um, alcohol abuse, substance abuse, and in some cases, domestic violence. So people would say, well, then they can go to the counseling center to get help. Uh, but counseling center data, at least as of 2000, 15, 16, therapist to student ratios are one to 1600. So it's not that it's bad, it's just not adequate to meet the demand. So I started thinking again, this is the, the mental health person and the human development and child development kind of stuff. And I don't believe these kids are just coming here to and, and going buck wild because that's what they do. I think part of that is parenting and how they're growing up. So again, um, and I think people have developed a program to make a long story short called the Clear Academy. 
CLEAR is an acronym for Character, Leadership, Education, Advocacy, and Responsibility. So I think when kids come to college and they start making decisions to get involved with substance abuse or drinking and get out of hand with it, it's sort of a lack of character. I mean, it's a lack of uh, leadership because when, when one group does it, somebody wants to do it because we all want friends. We want to be liked, so we kind of follow the crowd, which is really not leadership. It takes away from the um, reason you're here, which is education, the value that that has. The A is advocacy. How do you stand up for yourself? How do we not become a follower but become a leader because I'm here for a different purpose? And the R is responsibility. So I get to own the decisions that I make and the outcomes that happen. I don't think people mess up or fail or anything all in life. I think that's the language we tell ourselves. What I do believe is that we make decisions and there are outcomes for those decisions. They aren't good, bad, right, wrong. Sometimes they're not favorable, but it doesn't make it bad. It's just an outcome, stuff happens. So we become informed consumers whenever we get that new information from making a decision. So I think when we make a decision and the outcome isn't quite right, we think we tell ourselves we failed or I messed up or I made a mistake. And then we become a little gun shy about making another decision because we don't have the confidence anymore. We don't want the same thing to happen. Instead of flipping that script and saying, you know, I was willing to invest in myself and make a decision trying to grow and trying to learn. And here's what happened. So now I have more information. I'm an informed consumer. Now I can continue to move forward because I have more information, right? And we're patting ourselves on the back instead of penalizing ourselves. So I think when kids come to, so that's clear. So when kids come to campus, I think each generation of parent has with good intent tried to make it better for their kids. What that's equated itself to is I think we've bought our kids. I see parents bringing their kids to our summer camps and they're carrying their kids' equipment, right? And they're rushing. I know they got to get to work. We provide childcare. You can drop them off at 7.30. Camp doesn't start till 9. Camp ends at 3. You can pick them up as late as 5.30. There's no charge for that. So the time management piece is one. But if your child's old enough to come to camp, they're old enough to be responsible for their equipment. So I'll ask the kids, you know, I'll stop parents and say time out and we're, here's probably what we're trying to teach responsibility. Then I'll ask the child who's responsible for their equipment, the parent or the, or the athlete. And they'll say the athlete. And I'm like, so why is mom or dad carrying your equipment? So they grab it and you know, parents hear that and they're like, yeah, kind of thing. So um, we've done some post for the last six years. Um, we've done some post camp survey assessments and it's now become the number one reason parents are sending their kids to our camps because that adds the value. Um, when they're learning, they're not just coming to play all day. It's not a babysitting service. We're actually teaching them what I believe are transferable life skills that while the majority of them will probably never play collegiate sports or be professional athletes, they will go to college. And we want them over time um, to make better decisions. So information is repetitive. If I said, Crystal, do you have a favorite song? How many times did it take you to listen to it before you learned the words? Could you say one time? So it's about repetition. So if these kids hear this language and these concepts about character and leadership, education, advocacy, and responsibility over a week while they're at a camp and they hear it every day, all day, and they hear it at whatever camp they're at. Some parents, they're baseball one week, soccer the next, basketball the next. They're gonna hear the same message. That makes a difference. Um, that's kind of why I parents, and I love what I do. I love seeing these kids come back. I like parents. And, and say, hey, thank you. Don't know what you did, but my kids are going to bed. They're not fussing about what they eat because we talk about nutrition and hydration and how these kids, even so young, can begin to take responsibility for the kinds of things that they have and if they want to be not just better athletes, but to be the best persons that they want to be. Uh, that sounds like a really fantastic, fantastic program. Um, and very it's very, pop very popular. <laughs> Um, so, um, congratulations on your success, success, um, with that program as it continues to, to grow. Um, you've been, um, you know, at UCI or, or been able to experience UCI and its growth over, um, you know, some time. And so, um, I'm wondering if, you know, if you could reflect for me on what you think, um, you know, some of the, 
major changes or accomplishments um, are of the university have happened over um, the years that you've been here as a whole, but also, uh, you know, specifically for for the black community here. Well, OK, um, let me start by initially saying, and, and I didn't intentionally mean to leave this out, but um, in 1974, we were part of the crew, I was part of the crew that actually formed and started the Cross Cultural Center. Um, we were in trailers, um, sort of by what was the Disability Services Center or over by Humanities. And so to see the actual building now that is the Cross Cultural Center is a huge development. Recognizing that, again, they have the Joe White Room in, in that building when I would advocate that the entire center needs to be named Dr. Joe White Cross Cultural Center. The influence he had across cultures on students, putting in several through you know, graduate programs and having a pipeline with it. it wasn't just African American students or Black students. Um, but that's another story. So to see those kinds of changes happen as the campus has grown, uh, I think are instrumental. Um, and I need you to repeat the second part of that question. All right. So the question was about um, the 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 growth improvements, um, you know, major accomplishments of the university over um, the time that you've been associated with it in general, uh, but especially thinking about um, African-Americans, um, African yes. Um, I think just even, even people in positions, you know, um, Dr. Drake, the first African-American chancellor in the UC system was huge. Um, there were predecessors to my brother, Dr. Thomas Parham being vice chancellor with Dr. Horace Mitchell. Um, being here. So I think um, the hiring, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, diversity and inclusivity here. And while there have been strides made, uh, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, the resurrection, so to speak, of the Black Faculty and Staff Association uh, a few years back, which I think it started in 1980 and then we kind of resurrected that and I was president in that group. Um, for a number of, of years. Um, and I think it is, again, the leadership now with Dr. Kevin Bradford out of business. So getting the Black community more engaged, more connected, I think has been huge. Um, firing, not, not firing, the hiring of more faculty and staff. I think Dr. Douglas Haynes has done uh, an outstanding job in terms of outreach or trying to create visibility. Um, the tough job is though is that you can't just focus on one group. So throughout his office with the affinity groups that when Black oversees uh, out of OEOD, I think has been another way to kind of help connect the dots. Um, so again, they're making strides. The, the challenge for me is really how do we get better? I know that the, the, the politic of education says that, um, and this is in no way slight on other communities or other cultural pieces, but we um, are now a Hispanic serving institution, which means that 20% of the population is of Hispanic or Latin origin. But as African Americans, we are still at the same two and a half to three percent we were when I was an undergrad. So when we're talking about 250, 300 kids when there were 6,000 students here to have that same percentage be the same 50 years later is a little alarming. So while there are small visible pockets, I think the, the addition of the Center for Black Cultures Resources and Research is huge. Um, and it's a great start. Again, it's another resource for students that are here, but how, when do we put the effort into intentionally making this you know, an African-American or Black culture serving institution, much like it is a Hispanic serving institution. So it's, I, while I do little things to try to work with, engage myself with the community that is here, on a larger scale, I wanna figure out how do we get the campus to be intentional about literally don't make diversity, inclusivity, 
a politically correct buzzword when the actions and the information doesn't translate into what we're doing. Um, thank you for that reflection. Um, uh, you mentioned, yeah, oh, I don't want to cut that you answer, off. Did that answer your question? It did, it okay. did, right. it did. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned um, Dr. Douglas Haynes who oversees the Office of Inclusive Excellence. Um, and they have, you know, a, a Black Thriving in initiative currently. Um, right. um, and uh, what are your thoughts on um, how Black students, faculty, staff, the community here at UCI can thrive? Well, um, there's, a, there's another, there's an additional initiative that has been spearheaded by Dr. Michael Yasin called the End of Racism Initiative. Um, and while both I think collectively offer insights and opportunities for people to get better at understanding black culture and being sensitive to dynamics. Part of what I, I haven't seen is a significant portion of the black community in this campus be engaged in those things. There are certain professors um, that are instrumental and active with those groups. Uh, but I see a lot of non-African-American people that are also sort of championing those initiatives. And so how do we engage more of us to be involved in, in the community, changing the dynamic and the fabric of what it is? I think because we are, we are here, but we are few. And so we're so spread out that I think what becomes practice is to really become comfortable with where you are just to be able to get by because you're not with a lot of people that are like you um, so your relationships are very different and it's easy just to kind of get to do your job and then go home or do whatever it is you do that's detached from the university so staying engaged and really making this place something that's different so on one hand it's it's challenging because you want to be you want it to be more you want it to to be something that you're more engaged with but at the same time, it's like it doesn't present something that offers you that challenge. So it's, it's almost like a Gandhiism that says, be the change you want to see. Things aren't going to happen if you don't contribute to the development and the growth of that. So I think while both initiatives um, have great intent and have good uh, progress or reasonable progress with the kinds of things that they offer, um, I still want to figure out a way and want to help them figure out a way that we can get more of us or more of the African-American community engaged in changing the dynamic of what this campus looks like. Thank you. We've, we've covered so much um, during our conversation, um, but I want to make sure um, that we've covered everything that you wanted to talk about. Um, so is there anything that um, we haven't discussed that you that you'd like to reflect on? Uh, no, actually, um, I think from the questions ahead of time, and, and this has been refreshing. I'm certainly glad that you know, things like this, you know what I'm saying? How do we change that fabric? This last segment that we just talked about, doing things like this. Uh, so we keep a history so that students or families who come will know that we've been here all this time and that we still need to make a difference. I appreciate you. Um, you're, you're like a well-kept secret. You're in the library, you know, people don't know because we don't go to the library. <laughs> so how do we get you? How do we get people to know you? How do we get people to know the resource that you are and the opportunities that people can have to feel connected to find information that says, you know, we're not alone, we're still here, we're making a difference and we're going to be here. So, um, I, I love this project. I'm, I'm still trying to get people to, people out of my era that were here to say, hey, here's what's kind of going on. Here's another way that we need to do this. I'm not sure who has done this already, but people like Harry Legrand um, would be instrumental. He's, he was an RA, he was one of my RA mentors. When I was here, he was an RA with my older brother, Bill. So they're connected, um, he's done well. So the black folks that have come here even from back in the day that have gone on to do demonstrative things is, is a byproduct of the uc education uc irvine education specifically so there's dr winita watts dr rodney armstead steve washington my old college roommate gordon jackson still does my taxes 
So the kind of relationships when I do my taxes, so the kind of relationships that you form, you know, at that young age to be able to still have those people, you know, this many years in your life, I mean, is a testament to how we are and who we are, uh, both as a people, but, but also how we survive an environment to collectively come together so that everybody gets through it. It's not just one person in sort of the Eurocentric view of individualism. It is a collective and a community. I think the more that we see that and can generate that kind of a feeling, I think the better the growth of this community, the African-American community on campus can be. As long as I'm here for the next four years to try to make that happen, then I'll do what I can. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and it's it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to be uh, to participate in this project. Um, I have one more question for you. And okay. um, that is if you could describe your UCI experience in three words, what would those be? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, are we talking just my complete experience from both as an undergraduate and now a staff person for the last 20 some years? Yeah, sure. Um, wow, three words. <sighs> Creative would be one. Um, experiential would be another one. Had great experiences um, and continue to do that as this campus continues to grow and, and shine. And um, I don't know that it's a description of the campus, but I'd say thankful because I'm thankful for the opportunity that I had as an undergraduate. And you see things in hindsight that when I look back and see what I went through, things I did and where I am now and what I'm able to do in this environment, you know, clearly there's a reciprocal, relationships are reciprocal. So there are things that I can contribute to what's going on here, but that campus has also given back those opportunities for me to be able to do some of those things. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you again so much, Gerald, for, for talking with me. This has been great. I love hearing your stories. I really appreciate you. Yeah, and I'm sure I left some things out, but you know, when you get old, there's no prescription for getting old. So I don't remember everything. But Next time. This was fun. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a great day. You too.